anything's got. Okay. Um, Margaret, let's just. Okay, let's start the meeting. Yeah, go on, Andrew. Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to tonight's Environment Committee. It's just gone seven o'clock. Um, <laughs> I don't believe we're broadcasting live in video or audio, but it may be being recorded. Um, I'd like to welcome all the new members of the committee and, and our new members to the council as well. And uh, I'd just like, like to uh, just uh, pay tribute to the previous minister, uh, Joyce Squires, the, the previous uh, chair of the Environment Committee. I think we can all agree she did an excellent job and the, the committee worked well with her in control. And I hope to uh, continue in that stead. I would like to congratulate uh, Tom, who's the new vice chair of the committee, and look forward to uh, uh, working with Tom. So, um, with those introductions over, let's progress with the agenda. Any um, substitutes? Those are substitutes, yeah. Okay. Do we have any declarations of interest? Do we have any other declarations of interest? Okay, and being done, we'll move on to item three public participation. Um, we have, we have um, one speaker tonight, uh, Crystal. Uh, you've got an allocation of uh, five minutes to speak, and Margaret will um, be keeping an eye on the time. So, thank you for your uh, patience. And uh, over to you, Chris. Right, I'll try and make this as quick as I can. Um, so, my name is Chris Thorpe. I am the, I had my first lot on plot in December uh, 2008, about 12 years ago. And then I took on the Cypher Norfolk Road allotments from 2013, which I still hold today. And that included almost five years as the allotment forum chairman. And I've noticed the change in this committee since the review was initiated. I hope the newcomers will quickly come to understand the issues that are under debate here. So why am I here? Because I believe and feel that I have both a duty and responsibility to the 100 plus plot elders who I represent being approximately 12.5% of the block of the city. My understanding of these reports, the council and the NAS one, is that the council commissioned commission the NAS report to give them the evidence to address the perceived problem of the forum, which I believe the council should have been able to deal with in liaison with the sidetracks without the need for an expensive independent review. Overall, I find both reports quite disappointing. The NAS was commissioned to undertake a comprehensive review of a lot of provision in the city, but much seems to be missing in that it doesn't really provide an analysis of the problem with the forum. The fact that the council seems to have abdicated its responsibilities by withdrawing its attendance at forum meetings seems to be totally ignored. It is also especially disappointing that the promised presentation by the NAS to the Cypress and the forum has not yet taken place. I ask if it ever will. The NSA report makes sweeping statements at the end of that the systems currently in place for managing direct exercise are not working. This may well be so, but there remain no explain as to what and why. But it is not the experience of point of delivery where feedback from my tenants at Norfolk Road tells me that they think our site is well run and when problems do arise, they'll resolve quickly and usually without the involvement of council officers. But they explain something. And that they are generally very happy with the site and the way it's run in its overall condition. There are a number of fundamental elements missing from these reports. These include any evidence of a clear understanding of what is or was the intended role, role of the site reps originally, now and in the future, and why they were ever introduced in the first place. What uh, also missing is what is or was the intended role of the forum originally, for now and in the future. If you reference the NES report option one, um, there is no detail as to the significant changes they think will be needed 
or the road the council would have to take or the problems they believe they have identified. Uh, it is impossible to comment further whilst the full report continues to be withheld. I have asked for it, but it's refused, and it may well answer those questions. I feel it is fundamental to understand these matters fully by all parties and stakeholders before any real progress can be made. Without this, we are in danger of implementing change for change's sake and risk throwing the baby out of the bathwater. What is the site rep's role? And why was the site rep created, role created in the first place? Briefly, to take the burden of day to day trigger off the council, do we wish to lose this and go back uh, and retrogress? The site reps are our site holders' representative, not so non neo lackey of the council. There's been experience where the council seems to think that they run the site reps. Uh, we are simply their eyes and ears on the site to advise and help them. Do their job in running a management site. We try to make life a bit easier and less costly for the council. The site rep volunteer activities are very much secondary, and however useful to the council, they are secondary to the plot of representative role. What is the forum's role? And it's the distinction between it and the site reps. The forum is simply the collective of the site reps. Have one minute remaining, Mr. To pretend otherwise is anything but nothing else but disingenuous. The forum is not a separate body of the site reps. It is not a thing that turned right. It's not a conduit or an intermediary body. It is a talking shop, a baking chamber, whose role can only properly be fulfilled by holding regular meetings between the council and the select and elected site reps. The recent conception of its role at the heart of current problems uh, has led to site rep dis disenfranchisement. Ah. I really need a couple more minutes so I can. Andy, may I? Why are the present arrangements not working? At the October meeting of this committee, it was stated by one of the members that all was well until about three years ago, but now it has all gone wrong, it's broken. I agree it has all gone sandy downhill since the state, since the servants were taken over by a speak scene a couple of years ago. That what worked before should be able to work again and without too much effort. The council frequently maintains it is working in partnership with us, but rarely meets, we rarely meet with them in forum to discuss the day to day matters of mutual interest. I and other side reps simply feel disenfranchised and appreciated. What is not working in the council side rep plot over relationship is the abdication of the council's responsibilities to meet with us, and as I believe, very much at the root cause of our problems. It has led to the disenfranchisement of the side reps current unsatisfactory chaotic situation. This has been compounded by the forum effectively become defunct when it was rather unilaterally and arbitrarily suspended in January this year. We've had no meetings since January, since November last six months ago. I'd like to recommend that the recognition of the allotments is a city resident service and leisure service and not an operational problem to be done. I'd like to ask that you review the council department responsible for allotments, something more than the leisure services, like Cleveland and Green, where we used to be. I'd like to ask why option one was rejected. I believe that the current arrangements and structure are much to recommend. I would like to formally propose that option one be reconsidered in detail and discussion with the site rep before the council embarks on what surely uh, must be the more expensive option of bringing in a full time allotments officer. Generally, this whole issue appears to lack any in depth analysis of strategic thinking by the Council and could still be resolved by holding serious discussions with the site reps. Meanwhile, option two looks to be retrogressive, complicated to implement, potentially expensive and difficult to start. What really are its envisaged benefits? What were they? How could they be cost effective? What's going to be the impact on plot rental fees? And how long will it take to implement? In summary, the option one may currently be thought to be too difficult to progress, I personally have option two to prove to be much more so, requiring too much new and too many changes, far more than option one could possibly require. Um, on the agenda, item two, I note that the South to Finish Group um, work appears to be concluded. I, I, would, I would like to recommend that, that point is completely rethought. Um, and the thing that we planned all together. The next day, you understand, is to include discussion of the whole report of the council's future plans with the site reps, referencing Phil Gilmore, February 17th of May. I look forward to this. 
and hopefully the issue that I have outlined and discussed in great detail and the full NAS report will be made available to us so we're properly informed. We're going to work in partnership. You can't keep half the game secret. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chris. And we'll make sure we get a response from officers. I don't you want to, um, you've got your speech uh, typed out. Whether you want to I have, that. I can. Uh, you want to eat? Now, item four the minutes from the previous meeting. Do we have any uh, comments, amendments, issues? Richard? Yeah, thank you, Chair. I think the minutes are accurate, uh, but uh, there's just an issue which I'd like to raise on the minutes, which is on item 34. It's the end of the business about uh, the line decisions. I'm going to be more a little bit frustrated as we go on the line time now. The first race is in council, the then chair is in March of last year, and it's been converted to the land bill race environment committees and still the other ones are recommendations now that's moving forward. Um, it's quite a simple request to have some signage yeah, with some education and information about the yeah. disease yes. in areas where that would be useful. I mean, the most useful area in my area, in my ward, of course, is the long run nature of the area, so they will be as well. So I see no reason why we need to delay this much further and seek assurance at the next meeting there will be a report on, on this coming forward. It's been postponed now and come back for us for a long time. Through you, Chair, uh, thank you, Councillor Yu, for those comments. We, we almost got a report to this committee. Um, we have one 95% uh, developed, um, and we will work with, with, uh, with Chair to see whether we um, share that prior to the next committee or whether we bring a formal report to committee for, uh, for information and, and for approval. But, but that work is the thing is underway. Thank you. Oh. Thanks, Chair. Um, on page three of the minutes, which covers the item on the environmental sustainability strategy, uh, at the end of the final paragraph of the notes, it says that it was agreed that the Environmental Sustainability Officer will put together a report regarding the impact of the action plan in terms of carbon emissions. Um, the actual sentiment of the conclusion of that discussion was that that would come to this committee meeting. So I'd like the Minister to be updated if possible, Chair. Could you let us know when we might, um, if, if perhaps the next committee meeting, we could see that report? I can take that on the main chair and that is the opposite of the same. Those comments, which I think are actually a material amendment, so I, um, I'll sign off the, the minutes as accurate. Yeah. Uh, now, item five, the yeah, other main item of business is a review of delivery and management of allotments. And so, Vince Vaughan, um, I'm going to pass over to uh, Bill Gilmore by the two. So, let's take that one. Over to Bill. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, everybody. Um, can I just make one comment? There was some background noise, and I think it was by the administrators trying to fix the, the microphone. So, some of what was said previously was hard to hear. So, it's just so that when we're getting feedback, we can hear you. Okay, so um, thank you very much for, for that. Um, as you know, from, can you hear me clearly, by the way? Yeah. Yeah, okay. As you know from the, from the report, last year it was decided that to hold a, a fundamental review of the allotment service um, and to, to consider what works well within the allotments and also more importantly, to work out to, to to work through what doesn't work well and what can be improved. At the October committee, it was agreed that we would involve a, a third party organisation, somebody who has um, a, a lot of experience and, and knowledge of allotments, um, and that they would come and do an independent review, so that we can obviously get an independent view of how the allotments are performing, with a view to to making improvements going forward. So that aim, we engage with the, the National Allotment Society, NAS, um, and Colin and Liz are joining us from the NAS 
to go through the report that you've got at page 11 uh, and to give us an overview of the work that they undertook and the findings from that work. So if I can hand over to Liz, that would be great. Thank you very much. Yes, um, thank you for inviting us to this meeting, Phil. Um, I will just say that I, could, I couldn't really hear very much of um, what was said there. So it might be a little difficult when the questions arise. I just hope Colin is hearing more than I am because it's, it's um, very muffled sound which is coming across. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, good. Um, right, so my name is Liz Bunting and I'm the Legal and Operations Manager of the National Allotment Society. Um, joining us today is, is Colin Bedford, who is um, the NAS um, mentor from the West Midlands. And um, we were both part of the team that um, was involved with the review. Um, we've got uh, we have got a lot of experience of allotments. We've got over 90 years, actually, uh, not me personally, but uh, certainly, um, you know, the, the organize the society has. Um, we've been um, advising allotment associations and uh, local authorities and, and landowners through two world wars and now a pandemic. Um, so we were asked by Worcester City Council to produce a comprehensive um, review of the allotments in the city. And um, this was carried out in February and March of this year um, and included the 23 direct let sites and the two self-managed sites. So um, this was not just a desk exercise. Um, the methodology used included site visits to all 25 sites online surveys, direct let, self-managed and of the site representatives. And we also did uh, Zoom meetings, nine, nine two hour Zoom meetings with site representatives, forums, executives, self-managed committee and councillors from the task force um, finish group and council officers as well. Um, we reviewed all documentation and we carried out a benchmarking exercise against six other councils with um, similar sized allotment provision. Also, we spoke to other uh, organisations in and around Worcester who could contribute in various ways to allotment life um, and development. We looked at the governance aspects, data and performance and all this information was then evaluated and good practice options put forward within the report. Um, Findings, the key, key findings really, the two self-managed sites uh, were working very well. There was a strong community spirit coming across, good communication and with a high percentage of, um, of plot holders reporting that the self-management improvements um, were really positive. With the direct let sites, um, there was no real coherent management message coming through at all. And it looked as though there were failings within the operational um, aspects of the forum, which had, had become dysfunctional. There was little transparency and um, poor communications. So, I mean, that fact that it involved 23 sites um, proved to be um, the main issues to be remedied uh, within that, that aspect. The site representatives appeared to be very successful in their own sphere, um, capable, well-meaning individuals with a good deal of enthusiasm for the sites. So again, a positive result. Uh, with regard to water harvesting, I think that, that came across in, in evidence really that there was little um, actually going on and um, that would that aspect would save Worcester City Council um, a significant amount of money. 
by educating plot holders and encouraging them to harvest their own rainwater. Composting um, education and encouragement again um, would be advantageous and um, there was a sound basis there which was evident for biodiversity. The Wildlife Trust and the Worcester Environmental Group recognised how allotments provide uh, corridors for wildlife. So again, to be pursued and encouraged. Um, we put forward those six options um, all of which are operational in other parts of the country and, and NAS have experience of advising and assisting local authorities with these options. I'll just quickly run through those so that uh, Worcester City Council stay as they are with significant changes with option one. Option two um, to appoint uh, a full-time allotment officer Option three, force city councils to take back the allotments totally in-house. Option four was to adopt self-management. Option five, construct, um, sorry, a contract out to an independent contractor. And option six, um, to have a limited company who manage the allotments on their behalf. Now, what I will do tonight, I concentrate on one, two, um, touch on three, and, and also mention four, five and six um, do appear to have been discounted, really. Um, so option one, stay as, as you are with significant changes. Um, we could see the purpose of a forum, um, examined the forum operation and makeup, uh, but feel that that allotment could become forum could become a consultative group. Um, this would um, involve more involvement from Worcester City Council taking a greater ownership of the management and the forum in that case would take on an educational role, enhancing the experience for the community. Option two um, was to appoint um, the appointment of an allotment officer and this would be a dedicated experienced person um, site representatives probably still necessary because that would provide a liaison between the allotment holders and and the council um, an experienced officer would be able to obviously take charge of managing the waiting list, administer the legal agreements, deal with inspections on a regular basis, serve notices, um, assess risks on site, financial monitoring, advise on planning policy and liaise with the public health um, sector and also develop and monitor green initiatives and assist with capital bids for site improvements, ensure benchmarking continues and um, support, supervise uh, the, the site representatives, including induction training. So this would um, uh, um, encompass the duties which are currently spread across the present department and obviously costs vary with um, with the degree of experience of the person that you, you would be taking on in that option. Option three um, had many of the aspects of option two, um, but with no forum or site reps and two dedicated persons um, to for, uh, and administration backup. Option four, self-management, um, that option gives the, the to, achieve, to be able to achieve a cost neutral service. Two sites um, are already uh, proving that um, the self-management works there. Many variation, there are many variations of self-management and um, it, it's, gives the responsibility to the associations and reduces the council expenditure. So, but you must still um, keep in contact 
Um, that, that is absolutely vital. Um, with regard to the uh, aspects that you need to consider, there could be substantial costs involved. There would need to be site audit uh, take site audits taken place as part of the preparatory work. Um, survey of the sites to determine the condition of them, and um, it gives the option of the team teamwork and mutual benefits. It's necessary to have robust agreements and to ensure the capability of the people um, who, who are running the site. It's really localism in action and volunteers take on that, that, those management arrangements. And um, the council in those instances generally only deal with one person and the site can attract its own funding um, and therefore improve site facilities. So there are advantages um, there as well. And I think that concludes, if anybody's got any questions, hopefully uh, Colin will be able to hear. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, Liz. Uh, so I'll open the floor to any questions and one way or another we'll hopefully get them through through to Liz. Okay. So I've just been, just been advised that we're gonna ask um Phil Phil uh, Gibble to uh, just wrap wrap up first and then, then we'll go through the questions. Okay, thank you again, Chair. Um, it was fair to say as well, so thank you, Liz, for that, and uh, thank you for the report. But to say that within the report, there are other elements that are non-governance um, that, that we are taking on board and we'll, and we'll be looking to improve on. Uh, things like biodiversity, water usage, um, site improvements. See, these are all things that have been identified within the report that we'll also be looking at. So, uh, like I say, thank you to Liz for that. In terms of the actual options, we, we, we reviewed the options for governance. Um, we considered which offered the best um, options for improving the current situation at the most cost-effective way. Um, and we reported to task and finish um, with, with our report. And as such, we would like to offer the recommendations as follows and as, as seen within the report. Recommendations are that the, the committee notes the contents of the report and the findings of the National Allotment Society. Um, that they note that the allotment task and finish endorsement to progress further work in respect of option two, and that is the council to appoint a dedicated allotments officer and would reduce roles for the forum and site representatives. That, that, that doesn't mean that, that, that there are no roles. We want to engage with, with those bodies to ensure, you know, to ensure that they're actively participating in, in going forward. And, and we are, as part of our, our con consultation following this, we are going to be seeking their views on, on how best to do that. Um, but that, we, that you direct officers to undertake further work, in, including engagement with the stakeholders and interested parties. And finally, that you know that a further report for a decision will be presented to the committee in July, 2021 dealing the outcomes of this work thank you yeah thank you i just want to before we do it i just want to reiterate some of the points phil made in here so we're wrapping up there just to remind us how this started and what we're trying to achieve so we are you know, the route that we're going down is looking to invest in new allotment sites to improve health and safety, to make them fit the purpose uh, in, in, in terms of this, uh, site security uh, uh, and some of the physical aspects of the site. And, and also improve and maintain the environmental sustainability of the site and also make sure that they play a role in, in, in improving our environment and biodiversity. And, and also that they're being used to the maximum so that um, as a rare resource that, that they're being used as best as possible for, for residents of Worcester. Uh, and, and so what we're, what we're sort of suggesting, not recommending in, in the paper is 
it, it's to go down a path where we're not just going to invest, we end up investing capital investment into the office, but also in, in additional officer support to help with the effective running of the allotments. And certainly, in my mind, the, the officer that we're talking about, uh, um, we're preaching here, would, would be taking on the, oops, I'm going to try to use the right words, would be taking on the more unpleasant tasks that perhaps the sort of representative have to do, more confrontational tasks if, if they're having to um, enforce some of the rules uh, to make sure that the sites are being used to, to their best um, potential. And, uh, and, 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 the, and the task of thinking group, I think we, we did discuss these uh, options at length and, and the presentations from NAS and report. And, and uh, hopefully some of the, the members of the task of group can, can contribute um, this evening, because we've, we've, um, so we've lost a couple of the members that are no longer part of the committee. But we certainly did have a consensus that this was the what we thought was the best best way forward. So on that note, I'll open up the floor and uh, over to you, Richard. Yes, thank you, thank you, Chair. I was I was a member of the uh task and finish group and I think we did a reasonably good job in the process of coming forward with the recommendation which we did. And I'm on our place, so I would like to move the recommendation to draw on uh, page five of our papers. And I think it's worth saying that uh, no change to the allotment system, there must be no option. There's going to have to be an element of change, there's got to be an element of reform. But the way ahead, as I've been done gradually and with the consent of the people involved, uh, not to change imposed upon them, but we actually take the people with us. I think that is absolutely critical. I think consultation and how we move forward is going to be key and how we consult is going to be very important. Um, but I do believe. In the past few years, we as a council have abdicated some of our responsibility and handed the roles and some of those responsibilities to site representatives, which have not been in the best uh, interest of the council or the office themselves. And I can see that, I, that that needs to be brought back into house. I think the forum will have to continue in some style, in some way, in the future. Uh, but, the, but the site reps and the site reps will also have to continue. In some style, in some way in the future. But that role will have to be clearly defined so everybody understands what that role is, including the side reps, including all the other terms we have required. And I think there is a direct route now which is potentially to be established between our open holders and this committee, something which can be acted as a form of liaison between the two. The members of the council take an active part in the administration management uh, of this process. So I think we as a group of members should stop abdicating our responsibility for power. I have a vision of something like the Central Assembly and the Central Assembly where representatives come together with representatives of the council and reports and minutes come to this committee, which will give us give us slight insight into issues which are important to a lot of holders and can actually start the process of reform and change uh, to some of the issues which members are, are concerned about. I think we are we have to move ahead. No change is not an option. This is a change which is going to be gradual, and I think it's going to be in the long term the best interests of both the council and the lot of holders. And ultimately, long term, and I mean very long term, I'd like to see South Belgians on most of our lot sites. I'm a cooperator, I believe that people work for themselves together with others to actually achieve the best results. And so naturally, I would support that. I don't think we're ready for that this semester. I think there's going to be a long road step before we get there. And I think what we've suggested here is the start of the process and the start of the journey. And I would hope that we can do this to some extent. Thank you. Thank you for that question, Richard. And certainly, I think that, you know, one thing we've all learned is that there's a lot of passion in a lot of So I think Chris, it's nice to represent that, that passion that a lot of the holders have. And certainly, nothing is going to be easy. Gee, if we don't all work, work together on this. Um, do we have any other speakers? Yeah. Yes, I, I wouldn't go into the on them for this because some of the points have been covered, but the, the NAS report builds up the importance of the people issue, uh, the environment and the diversity. It's probably the way we do our format. In, in our report, we shut down our bottom. And I hope that when we do the when we do the final and sent to the my report, it's proper. Um, I'm making the point that allotments are something that we want to provide 
the retina of the body and not something captured by the brain and so it's got to go around. Now, I was going to say that the, when I had a uh, more severe relationship with uh, the the forum is not as, as it's been described. Um, it, it's been described as a gatekeeper rather than a conduit. But, uh, but I have taken some soundings and I've found the evidence is that um, what you found is correct. Uh, something has gone wrong. And it's, it's, no more longer function for the benefit of a lot of them. But I still have a concern. Richard talked about um, the side breaths. The paper implies a reduced, uh, a reduced uh, uh, raw of side breaths. Now I can see absolutely that um, it, it, we've got in this weird position where they're, they're assuming that this is more serving. Is that not? They want to manage their sites and see if it's going okay. I've got that. But I think if you're going to go through option two, in a, in, in a way, you're going to enhance the role of the site trips. You're going to have to give them more weight. And, and, and you can say what you like about the forum, but it might be that those site reps decide to meet the forum. It's not within, you know, it's not supposed to be so But that's, that, that would be my only sort of. Um, my only concern about the paper is written so far that um, I don't think that the bereavement uh, thing is you know, it's entirely appropriate. If anybody's been on the bereavement search committee, they'll know that it's entirely appropriate. And um, the goals thing, I mean, what a success that's been. So uh, I don't even forget that. So there is a model that uh, that, that, that up there. So my plea is one, build up the environment thing at the top. And the people think of the top recognize that site wrecks are not just just there, they're vitally vitally important. Uh, and, and and get the most out of them because if you don't, it's just going to be an officer dealing with X number of individual plot holders. That just won't work. Right, thank you, Andy. I, I, I do agree about the site because I think it's changed change role rather than a produced role and, and maybe focusing more on positive things rather than. I forgot, I forgot my point of fact. Um, uh, Robin's here, and he can speak to it better. Right? But uh, when we talked about Leeds, Leeds a lot, we've also got a, a parish council, which has got an excellent allotment uh, system. And um, that's not quite like what you've paid that now. Thank you. Uh, Neil? Thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Just yeah, um, just a couple of comments for a genuine question. Uh, on, on the 20th of May, um, an allotment board of 20 years sent an email to several councillors, myself included, um, in complaint that uh, they must be part of the, well, not been able to contribute to the report that's been summarised this evening. I just felt obliged to raise that. Um, I'm just going to park that one. Um, second comment is in regards to 3.10 on page 7. And it seems to me a validation of recommendation 1, which has been given a very powerful endorsement by the public participant speaker this evening. I'll just read the first sentence. Uh, the table of forum would seem a prudent and sensible approach resulted in the review. And um, it would seem that the role of the forum and its membership applies to refreshing. Seems a very sensible sentence to me, um, and it does seem a validation of option one. So the question is can in recommendation 1.2 on page five, I'm not going to like in saying this, um, but can it also include work by officers on option one as well as option two? I um, appreciate that extends the remit, but. I think the speech that we just heard has been very powerful from someone who's actually involved in the conference. And some of what Richard uh, Council Rudolph said also seemed to me in support of option one, perhaps unintentionally. So the question is can recommendation 1.2 be amended effectively to include an investigation of option one as well as option two, rather than us as a committee just say, yeah, let's go ahead for option two. Thank you for 
And Chahidi and Sadi Kels are also the points. And I think the answer is, um, it is, is, is hopefully the moving forward in that we try to reassure our members um, around the, the future role of the program and the future role of the site practice. But I would still uh, mention about engaging with the all stakeholders moving forward. Um, but I think the fundamental reason for us recommending the option is, is, is the council, as council you mentioned, about taking responsibility, taking more responsibility on, and, and have the delegated resource. At the moment, I, I acknowledge and recognize a lot of what Mr. Bob says because you know, um, a lot of the time we don't probably have one individual to be able to relate to. And so, for us, the fundamental change is, is options. I mean, it is the council that have the dedicated resource to be able to work with the forum and the site reps up a lot of the time. So, that's the reason why we agreed and hopefully the report was, gives a sense that the, the forum is not under threat. It's very much the council. Staff that said it's about the clarification of the roles and responsibilities. Thank you. Did you want to say something else? I'm happy, but I still want to kind of pick this hand up first. Well, it's me that does it. Okay, so thank you. Thank you, Chaboy. In the meantime, uh, while this investigation is going to run into option two with a due to present the report at committee in July. Can I simply ask that an insurance be given to the forums in their current state that they will be very much part of the long range management in the future? Because um, I'm gleaning from that one, it was only that there's, there's, a, there's a feeling among some of the colleagues that they're not part of this process. So my question is simply can a communication be made to those colleagues that while this option has been investigated, forums very much have a place in the management of this forum? And I think mean, one would be better have been in person dialogue with the, with the individual and also our visitors to um, the issue frames and also to <clears throat> what comments have taken place that were promised during the process and to make sure that obviously we're on top of it and going forward, and especially you know, this is the step. So after this evening, we need to communicate and, and be on top of that communication strategy. Um, so I hope that can happen for sure. For sure. Um, I'm going to totally agree with me a little bit. I'm not that much of a woman, but I can't. I can't. As somebody who sat on the task of the ministry and is involved in a lot of stuff, I'm quite old. Um, I think it's important to recognise that Chris is here tonight. Representing yourself, not representing the whole, not representing the forum. So it's point of balance, but I think you, you know, it's we don't have the chair of the forum here. Um, we don't have other site reps here to discuss their issues. And I think one thing that did come out of the NAS meetings that we had and the report was that the forum and the site reps, it, they do need refreshing. We do have several site reps who have been in place for a long time with no regular connections. Um, and there is, there has been a bit of a, a culture in sort of bullying and harassment, and I do think that, that there has to be some sort of stepping back of the site reps and the forum and have them as, you know, to do the more social aspects of a lot of things, not to deal with the business of, you know, tenants and mules chasing people for rental payments, you know, doing health and safety and stuff. That has to be done by the council, and that has to be done or oversight of this by councillors. Because at the end of the day, we are the landlords, the city council owns this land. The site reps are, do not work for the city council. Um, they are volunteers who choose to do this. Some site reps are a lot more active than others. No one can see one of the more active site reps. Others just want to garden, grow their fruit and veg, and get on with life and don't want to be bothered by things. So there's a, there's a huge amount of disparity across the sites as a result of that. But what I do think is that no volunteer in the business of being site to do is to be the person who's chasing people and the person who's doing the job for the council. So because of that, I just don't think option one is remotely valid. It's, it's just not a viable thing to do. Things have to change. We can't just go back because it was three or four years ago. Um, it was three or four years ago, but things have changed since then. Structure of the council has changed since then. We can't go in first. 
I want to agree broadly with what um, Neil said. Um, but I also want to point out that I've had a lot for six years. I didn't know what the was going on. So I agree with Kyle. Let me point back in on that. I had no idea what was going on until I was going on. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, Chris, if, if the, the council um, regulations don't allow any more contribution other than your slot, I don't have to start in here, so sorry, but uh, very well, because I'm here, can't uh, all contribute to this stage. Um, I don't know if uh, anyone can hear us from uh, now, so we'll, we'll, we'll all be more about the communication that has been done, because there was substantial effort to communicate with bottleholders, so I can. Yeah. Chair, thank you, and thanks for members for, for, for raising that. I, I, I will refer to um, colleagues um, at NAS probably uh, in the first meeting just to, to, just to reassure us around the, um, the communication channel that they were going to, to uh, mention that uh, as well. But now that members have raised that, I, I will ensure that when we go into the next part of the engagement, subject to approval of this report, um, we will look into why not all members are received. Um, communication and we make sure we rectify that. Right, I don't know whether colleagues from um, from NAS will be coming first and I'll come to that chat share with you, Phil. Yeah. Do you want Liz to come over to comment? Okay. Yeah. 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 So sorry I didn't hear that. Did you we can hear you, yeah. The sorry, but the the sound quality is abysmal. Okay, I'm not sure there's anything more that we can do. So, so is that Colin who just spoke? Yes, it was. Okay. Um, right. Can I communicate with Colin and Liz? Because I think I heard. Okay. Colin, can, we, we can hear Colin. We can hear you. Yes, but we can't hear the the council committee. Okay. Um, I think I heard both sides. If you would like me to communicate with Colin. Okay. Basically, basically on a particular statement on, on the efforts made to communicate with our bondholders. That's that's where I'm. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately, Chair, the, the sound quality from your end is not great. Colin, the, the, a, a number of points were raised about the communication with plot holders and a number of plot holders um, indicating that they hadn't been involved or contacted. Okay. Um, um, Okay to respond? Yeah. The intent was never to communicate directly with plot holders. That would just be a, an exercise that, would, well, a data protection wouldn't give us details to allow us to communicate. We had weekly meetings with the council officers or officer, Guy Powell, and I provided a fortnightly bulletin to start with up until the stage where we um, had got no further information really to um, report. So I'm not quite sure what was required that we weren't giving. I'm sorry, I, you know, I'm not quite sure on the question. Yeah, that's right. Um, we'll wrap that up with the building from this stage. Thank you, Chair. I'm probably looking for myself, but we'll make sure, Chair, at the next stage, um, we'll check and make sure you lay all these details, um, not just for our members or site perhaps, but plot all of them as well. We'll explore uh, where you can go to everybody, but we'll make sure that we uh, double check and check. Got, uh, to to the 
appreciate it myself. Richard? Just, just briefly to say that uh, I'm not going to hold some part of the process and um, want to make sure that that is happening. And we're, I'm really, when you're looking at the option two, it is an enhancement of option one. It's uh, something to do with option one we've done on here. Uh, it gives us the only things we had previously, plus a bit more of the Gavard officer. Uh, so I don't think there's anything to clear from the proposal which we've got before us today, but there's something which is missing from the report, which was discussed at the um, uh, the task and finish brief. I'm not sure whether this is the right place or process to, to raise it, which was a request to send some uh, information to the planning committee regarding potential new developments uh, in the city where there's some properties of more than 1,000 running to be built. At least 20 uh, allotment sites should be included within it uh, for the planning game. So, some of which we did request to be sent to the planning committee for further action and uh, to make sure that that was potentially included with. Uh, development sites across the city. Clearly, there is a great demand for allotments. There's waiting lists on nearly all the sites, and there are people wanting a new allotment. Uh, we haven't got enough spaces, we haven't got enough allotments. Demand is high, and the, uh, the availability is low. So, we need to get more allotments up and running. And the only way we can do it is through new development sites. But we do need to ask the planning committee for that kind of response, if possible. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, okay. okay, we're all fin finished. Are we happy then? Oh, sorry, um, Simon. Um, yeah, first of all, I'm going to like the report of the last point. Um, but further to that, just to, just to make the point that if a lot of holders feel agreed that they've not heard anything about this process up until now, that rather does suggest that the site representatives have not communicated perhaps as well as they should do. And I think that um, supports the position that we seem to be taking in favour of option two. Um, the site representatives can't be expected to do everything, but having somebody um, uh, who's responsible to the county um, directly involved can only be an improvement. Thank you, Simon. I mean, in fact, this is an, this is an investment in a lot of the space that we're, we're, we're suggesting here. So, um, if we have no more uh, contributions, are we happy then to note the recommendations as laid out in the report? In front of us? Are we? We're moving on now to item six, the, which is a, uh, a national resources waste strategy for England. So these are consultations that have come from uh, central government, the, uh, the city council, in, in, in consultation with other uh, waste collectors and the waste, waste disposal authority are um, responding to. Um, so uh, we have um, some recommendations uh, on, on the paper and I won't read them, and we'll, we'll pass over to um, Bill to uh, introduce this item further. Okay, thank you again, Chair. Um, there is a presentation to help support the report, so I guess that's going to be played from your end. If, um, yeah, if you've, if you've got the presentation put around the table, let's see if I can, uh, I will try and get it up whilst um, we're just waiting. If you just excuse me, I have to leave. I don't think you want me here for the rest of it. Indeed, thank you. Good night. Thank you. Okay, Phil, you should be able to see the presentation up on the screen. Um, okay, thank you. So, as the chair mentioned, um, 
the, the government has brought out three consultations as part of the National Resource and Waste Strategy for England 2018. Next slide, please. So the aim of this consultation and the, the aim of the National Resource and Waste Strategy is um, to help achieve a more circular economy, um, to increase the segregation and treatment of waste streams, and it's aimed at a new target of recycling of 65% of municipal waste by the year 2035. Uh, and the Environment Bill is legislation for delivering the strategy. And the three consultations are extended producer responsibility. This has a, sub a submission deadline of um, next week, as does a deposit return scheme consultation. And then the third consultation, uh, which was held back and has only recently been um, issued, is consistency in recycling collections. And that looks at the materials and methods of segregation. It looks at separate weekly collection of food waste from all households and consideration as to free garden waste services being provided. So next slide, please. So extended producer responsibility is aimed at packaging. So um, that, that can be cardboard, it can be containers, it can be bottles, it can be glass, it can be plastics. And, and it's based on the producer pays principle. And, and, and it's looking for local authorities to be able to recover their full net costs um, of providing collection and, and processing services. Um, it will be benchmarked and you know, local authorities will be required to produce, uh, provide, should I say, efficient and effective services and, and only incur necessary costs. The, the consultation itself has 104 questions. These are mainly aimed at producers and how the scheme should be administered, what, what material should be in and out of a producer responsibility. But there were five key chapters with 30 questions for local authorities. Um, the waste partnership response is relatively positive, has concerns all the payments will be made, but sees it as, as, as a, a sort of revenue stream to local authorities for in the main providing services that already exist, albeit dependent on, on the consultation, we could be asked to provide additional collection um, facilities or, or to take in additional materials. So that's, a, that's the extended producer responsibility on packaging. Next slide, please. Deposit return scheme. Again, the aim is to increase recycling, the, the quality of it, the quantity, and to reduce littering. And it's about, a, you know, in the schemes like this used to exist many, many years ago where a deposit's paid on a drink container and then you get the deposit back once you return the bottle or the, or, or the, the container back to um, the redemption point. Um, local authorities are, are going to be able to refor, recover the full net costs. Again, quite a big consultation, 78 questions with four key chapters. Um, and 17 questions that, that are aimed at local authorities. Previously, the Waste Partnership responded, and most of the city was part of that response, and this was in 2019, and they questioned the need for such a scheme. Um, and the response really is, again, looks like it will be questioned, is there a need for such a scheme, especially given the impact of uh, extended producer responsibility and the level of recycling collections that go on on the curbside. So, um, you know, th this is not something that's been uh, openly uh, welcomed. Next slide, please. So, local authority payments as part of the, uh, of the consultation, obviously an important section, because it will determine how we get paid and how much we get paid um, to deal with packaging waste. There will be scheme administration that will be appointed. And as I said previously, the broad principles are that it's an efficient and effective service and that the costs that are expended are necessary costs. Payments are likely to be based on the quality of material that's collected and, and obviously tonnages of that material. Um, and the scheme administrator will be um, supporting local authorities to, to meet performance benchmark and to improve on existing services to obtain full payments. So as I say, this is an area that, that you know, most authorities have just got some concern 
in ensuring that the payments do reflect the true cost um, of, of providing the services. Next slide, please. So the potential impacts and some of the dates, the local authority payments, as I said, to cover full costs. The impact of deposit return scheme on the existing recycling service and on the disposal contracts as it currently stands, because as you know, we, we, we supply our material to the county disposal arrangements uh, and we'll still be required to collect the remaining materials. I read within the uh, consultation that the um, DEFRA calculate that currently 70% of containers are collected by via curbside recycling. And they estimate that if a deposit return scheme is introduced, 90% of overall material will be collected by the deposit return scheme and that local authorities will simply collect 70% of the remaining 10%, i.e. so we will drop from collecting 70% of the overall um, available um, container stream to 7%, but we'll obviously still providing the full service of collection. The, one of the aims is to reduce littering. So containers on the go um, is, is one of the aspects that's being considered. And then the hope being that they'll be returned to, to um, suppliers rather than discarded. The key dates, the draft response was received at the end of last week. Um, the district amendments and the sign off response is for the end of this week. Um, then the, the, the county will um, finalise and circulate responses to the districts, and then it's up to us to upload our responses by the 4th of June. Next slide, please. So the consistency consult consultation hasn't got to be responded on until July, um, and it's still being worked up. Um, and, and there's lots of comments and lots of views as to, as to this. Um, weekly collection of food seems to be a key aspiration of the consultation. Um, and officers from Herefordshire and Worcestershire Waste Partnership are reviewing the options and the potential implications, both from a um, carbon perspective and from a cost perspective. Um, the consultation response really looks against, you know, we, we look like we're going to be responding that we're against the introduction of separate food waste collections. Uh, that's obviously for, for a decision. Um, and there are concerns about the additional resources to be increased vehicles, the environmental impact of those. And again, it comes back to will true cost recovery be made. Alternative, uh, sorry, anaerobic digestion is seen by the government the most effective way to treat food waste. So what the government's looking to do with weekly collection of food waste is to pull it out of the existing waste stream, to remove it from energy from waste facilities and from landfill, you know, on a few occasions, waste does go to landfill and actually take it to anaerobic digestion to, uh, to generate energy. Um, source segregated recycling is preferred. Now, Anybody who's been to Wales will see that in Wales, people have sort of three or four boxes, they have a little trolley, and, and, and they basically put each material into a separate box. So glass will go in one box, plastic in another, paper and card in another, so on and so forth. And that's collected in, in smaller vehicles and source segregated at the curbside. However, um, as much as this has been a preferred option in the past, TEEP, whether it's technically, environmentally, economically, practicable will apply and that will mean that the authority will be will be able to put forward a case to maintain its existing commingled collection service um, if it can demonstrate that, that it's best uh, practice as far as TEEP is concerned and just to give you an overview commingled collections similar to what we do um, and, and, and some variations on what we do are widely operated throughout England as are the use of material recycling facilities to segregate the waste once it's been collected. So this is a, you know, it's a well-known service and a well-used service. So going to um, source segregated would be a major change nationally. Uh, next slide, please. And then continuing on the consistency consult consultation, the, uh, the, there is a, a view that uh, authorities should consider whether free green waste collections should be, be given. 
Um, again, what the government's saying is that this would be at a basic level, i.e. one bin every fortnight, and the authorities could charge for additional service, second bins or more frequent collections. But as, as you know, at Worcester, we, we, did, we, we charge for the service already. So there'd be a loss of revenue. There would be an increase in recycling because it would move collected recycling because it would move a lot of green waste away from the household recycling centres, but would obviously inc increase resources needed to collect from, from virtually every property that was on the scheme. Um, so, as I say, the Waste Partnership is working on the draft response at the moment, and the approach is to be fed, fed back to leaders in mid-June. So, so that one in itself is, is ongoing. We're, 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 we're close to a completing extended producer responsibility and deposit return scheme. So that's the end of the actual presentation. Uh, and, and, and before we go to questions, if I could just go to the recommendations of the report, that the committee notes the context of the report, in particular the, the three policy proposals that are out for consultation, EPR, DRS and consistency in household collections and delegates the corporate director homes and communities in consultation with the chair of the environment committee to review the proposed responsible responses when available because the consistency one won't be available for a week or two um, from the strategic waste partnership and to uh, to amend these consultation responses um, as appropriate um, and to reflect the views of the city council and then to approve the submission of the final responses. Okay, thank, thank you, Phil. So, so in summary, we have these uh, quite complicated um, consultations coming through the government. We don't act alone because we're we're the collection authority. The Worcestershire County Council is the disposal authority. So therefore, our our sort of waste disposal supply chain. Is, is integrated with the county as and alongside all the other districts. Um, of, of the three they, they, so therefore the responses in, in detail are being worked up together collaboratively, collaboratively with, with, with the other partners and, and what this paper is basically saying is that we're going to look at them and finesse them as they come through, which is normally in, in, in short uh, timescales. And of the um, consultations, some of them are relatively straightforward, as in it's, it's suppliers being made to pay for the packaging they produce, and the collection authority would receive additional funds, which is the uh, EPR. So that seems to be mainly positive. The deposit return scheme is, is more complex because you've obviously already got a collection service in place, and, and this would uh, complicate matters somewhat and has many implications. And then things like the food waste, they think that they're, they're going to happen regardless um, and so on. So I'll open up the floor if anyone's got any questions or, um, or on, on the, the presentation. Neil. Thank you. We've got a lot of positives uh, in this one. Uh, of, of the three listed in 1.1, um, obviously, Point uh, bullet point three consistently consistency in household and business recycling is the one that, as a council, we'd have more influence over. Um, obviously, I'm going to hone in on food waste. Um, as a first raiser at this council 2013, um, on page four of the report 5.1, um, it says the rationale for the policy is to increase national recycling rate. Um, 65 percent by 2035. Well, when Councillor Roberts and I went to Abingdon to have a chat with uh, council, councillors and council officers, um, we discovered that their recycling rate was already in the mid 60s, uh, and that was largely largely attributable to the fact that they had very successful food waste collection. In around 2010 or 2011, uh, Witchhaven District Council commissioned a report called um, Value for Money, Waste Service Comparison. And indeed it found that South Oxfordshire has the highest recycling rate in the whole country, reinforcing what Council Roberts and I discovered in our visit in 2013, that food waste collections have um, 
you know, relationship with the high recycling rates. So this is brilliant to read this in the report that this 65% recycling target is um, part of national policy. Um, I'm almost done, trust me. Um, I went through the archives in preparation for this meeting and had saved some information provided by people campaigning against the incinerator in Hartlebury. Now, I know it's a fact now, it exists, but back in the day, they sent myself and other people lots of information. And I just want to hone in on this piece of information, um, particularly as um, at the top of page five, it says, obviously, a food waste collection would have significant capital and revenue implications. Well, in relation to that point in the report, this quote from the campaigners is this. Large savings can be made because the separated waste can be treated on the open waste market, where costs are around a third of incineration. I appreciate that this statement was made in the early 2010s, but I want to share it in endorsement of the plans to introduce the food waste collection. It is cost saver. Um, and if we are here tonight to make a recommendation that you, as chair of this committee and the corporate director, reflect the, the views of this council and make a plea to you tonight to endorse the, the idea of introducing food waste collections. Um, primarily because of what you shared tonight, that South Oxford have done it. It's historical, we can do it here. So thank you for presenting this report. I hope that's useful. I hope that you and the corporate director reflect the value of food waste collections and all the other good stuff in this report. Yeah, Tom. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much for that very comprehensive report, actually, and the explanation and the presentation I found very helpful. Um, I think, actually, I wonder whether we would want to challenge some of that emerging view. Um, I think it's absolutely right that officers are suggesting that we ask the question of costs and ask how these different initiatives are going to be paid for because we, have, we all understand we're under very strong budget constraints to the council. So that's really good. But um, if you look at, I mean, actually this slide here, it's not numbered, the slide of the circular diagram is quite helpful because if we're talking about this extended producer responsibility, this is really about recycling and packaging. And the bit of this diagram that's problematic is it always shows inevitably when you recycle stuff, what you get when you recycle is not as high quality as what you had to produce in the first place. There's always a flow of some new raw material in, which we extract, and there's always a degree of some, something coming out that is either not as useful as the first raw material we wanted, or has to just be disposed of. So this extended uh, producer responsibility takes us towards what we call circular economy where stuff can be fully reused, but doesn't quite get us there. Now, the beauty of the next bit that gets covered, the deposit return scheme, this idea that you use a bottle and then you give it back and it gets washed and reused, that is circular. You don't lose anything in that process. And the energy you put into washing that bottle is unimaginably less than the energy you put into taking broken glass, separating it, melting it and recycling it. So this DRS, this deposit return scheme, is much closer to the end point we're shooting for than what we can do with this extended producer responsibility on its own. So I, I, I challenge the argument that if you're going to do the first thing, you don't need to do the second. You, you do need to do the second. The deposit return scheme is, is a good thing. If it means we're recycling less waste, Yes, we have to think about our own problem. That's part of the question we ask back. We don't say, let's not do it. And I, I had the chance actually to live in Germany for three months where they did this. And it was amazing. But I found it hard to believe people would do it, but they did. They put their bottles in the, in the box. They took them back to the supermarket with a meter, shot them in the machine, put their money back, and carried on. Uh, and it, it worked remarkably well. So I think I think we as a council should be supporting DRS, even in even in uh, parallel with ERP, the extended producer, EPR, the extended producer responsibility. Um, also, I recognize there's a cost question. Like I said, we should be asking those. 
Um, but when you clean a bottle, that's an awful lot cheaper than you recycling that bottle. That cost saving is available somewhere and a well-designed policy should make it available for us. Um, the last thing I would add is on green waste and food waste. If green waste and food waste doesn't get composted properly or digested properly, what happens is it, it digests itself anaerobically and that produces methane. Methane is 25 times worse for the atmosphere for climate change than carbon dioxide is. Whereas if it's properly composted or it's digested in terms of gas that we then burn, it's released as CO2. Now that will get recycled in the churn in our atmosphere because it's green waste. But it's much better that goes up as CO2 than up as methane. And so actually we, we should again be supporting green waste collection and food waste collection as soon as possible because the carbon impact is very significant. It seems like a no-brainer. Um, so I don't know, Chair, what the mechanism would be for us to perhaps present back to officers. Could you reflect on that and reflect that in discussions with the other district councils and maybe move our position that way? Because at the moment, if the uh, proposal is that we note that if we have the um, if we have the uh, first bit extended producer responsibility, we don't need DRS. I think actually I would suggest we disagree with that. That both can be complementary. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Uh, and thank you, Chair. Yes, I'd, I'd rather agree with Tom that there's things in here I don't agree with. So what do we do? I mean, the uh, the, 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 the green waste is a, a real irony, and we we're talking about this circular argument. Monty Don, a recent program, uh, said that uh, a garden can't possibly produce enough compost for its own need. So what we do is um, we put compost in a bin, have it taken away, um, and that adds to our, our recycling rates. Well, there's something there's something cockeyed about the whole thing. I mean, we, we should, that's the last thing we should be doing. We should be encouraging people. And I know the argument some gardens are too small to have a bit more compost, but they're small gardens, they don't produce their, their amount of stuff. So there's something a bit wrong there. Something. And by the way, I'm, I'm very grateful to, to Neil reminding us about the South Oxford. She's absolutely right. They're a brilliant system there. What they've done is uh, outsource the whole thing to a private company. And they were they were resort, absolutely relentless in going out and keeping engaging with people, not like a, a, a cancer might do. They just kept going and going, and they were successful. And something we might consider again. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Uh, Richard. Thank you, Chair. Nothing more to really add to what's already been said. Other than I think I'm able to notice a a mistake in the recommendations. Um, and now I think about custom and practice, but normally in the board, but consultation should take place with the chair and the vice chair of the board committee. I just wonder why that is not the case in this case, in this incident, and um, whether we can make a small change to incorporate that. But on the basis of what we just heard from the vice chair, I think that might be a valuable contribution. Thank you, Chair. Um, based on the, uh, the recent uh, political changes, uh, Council Leader, we, we took advice on, on that recommendation um, and, and we felt that was appropriate. I can, I can, re, I can re, um, re have that conversation just to make sure that we have got it correct. Um, but, but that's based on, on, on the recent changes. And Louise, can speak? Thanks. Yeah, it was just to, to sort of echo what Neil was saying and then what Tom said and what Andy had said. Um, I think the idea of recycling is that we shouldn't be doing it because recycling is not actually a good thing. We want to stop making a lot of things that we don't need. So we want to encourage people to not make packaging. I don't want things coming in plastic trays and wrapped up in lots of things and like buy the you know loose um, which is the more you recycle the less you get out of it the more energy it wastes uh as deposits in for bottles is great i used to live in new york you've got 10 cents for a bottle that you return to the bottle bank i would disagree slightly with tom there i don't know how much it works in germany but in the states it doesn't work that well uh it is generally homeless people collect them so they can get changed for you know shelters for the night or food or other you know more nefarious activities um, but you know, I think I think it's a good thing. The one thing that I would say is food waste collection absolutely needs to be done. 
The Grubbs and Wellway food waste was collected from about 1993 onwards in Trafford in South Manchester. Um, a lot of people didn't like it at first, they didn't like having the little caddies in their kitchen because they started smelling after a few days, but actually people get used to it now, everybody does it. But as a council, I think we need to actually really encourage people to not generate that much waste. So have the things there for them, have the green waste collections and the food waste collections, but also direct people to like the Let's Waste Lab website, encourage people to do things like home composting, hot bins, or Makashi composting, which is fabulous, because then you generate no waste whatsoever, you can compost everything, including meat and bones. And those are the kind of things that we should be doing in conjunction with this. So I'd quite like to see that perhaps as chair and vice chair, you encourage that form of communication with the residents to look at alternative methods to recycling, such as not creating the waste to begin with. Thank you. Simon? I think something which would be very helpful to probably nearly everybody who lives in Worcester is to have a detailed description of everything that they can put in their green bin and everything they can't. And to remind them, for instance, not to put dirty pizza boxes in there, which completely mess up the whole bin. Um, a lot of people don't know what colour plastic goes in the green bin, what goes in the black bin, whether uh, tin foil is taken for recycling. These are fundamental questions which I doubt that more than a handful of people in Worcester could get everyone right. So I think we should be pushing for that detailed information to be put um, in front of everybody in Worcester and to be continually put in their face. Because anybody who's put in the wrong stuff in the green bin risks fouling up the whole system. Um, it, it's another question what happens it, to it at the end of the day. We come on to that. But I think we need better information. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, thank you. Uh, nice contribution. I certainly agree with uh, most of them, and certainly communications is a is a vitally important one. I think I think it, you know sometimes we just we just think that sending something out on Twitter and that's the comms done. And I think with with recycling, it needs to be a, a continuous process. Just time and time again, just repeating the same message. It is complicated, and it's complicated further by packaging. Um, which tells people that this it's recyclable when it it might be theoretical that it's recyclable, but only in you know, very specialist places. And um, so, so, so I just want to pick up on say some of the things that we mentioned. Um, the the EPR, the extended reduced responsibility. I think I think one of the benefits of that will be reducing packaging and also potentially reducing materials and making the materials that are in the packaging uh, more likely to be recyclable. So I think, so I think the, the EPR one, I think that, that isn't controversial from a council perspective or from, or from, that, from that perspective because of it's, it, it's common sense. I think, although, no, although um, food waste was, was being mentioned, I think, I think that you know, the message coming from the government that it's inevitable, but I think it, it's not without its complications because you're adding an extra collection, so extra vehicles, which is a capital cost and, and aerobic digesters, which again don't need to be uh, funded and, uh, and built. Uh, but if we do that, you know, assuming we go down that route, then then we hopefully be able to use um, the um, emission-free vehicles for those collection rounds um, and the funding from government. The green waste. I, I always struggle why it's called waste, uh, uh, green waste, and why it's included in some of the stats where we we include the collections in the brown bins as if, as a, as if it's the same as um, people recycling plastic and cardboard. So, uh, so yeah, I, I, I do struggle with, with some of the definitions. Uh, and I think one of the key ones is waste, waste reduction. I think one, one of my concerns with food waste is that you basically saying it's okay to waste food. 
um, and got almost giving people permission where obviously ideally we wouldn't want um, food waste in the first place. And, and obviously there's opportunities to uh, deal with that at home if, if you um, have a composter or a, a worm composter, like I have here, the fortune to have a garden. Um, the deposit return scheme, I do, I do have, um, I do have a concern with. Um, you know, it, it's effectively generating a reverse supply chain, uh, and 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 obviously the the, the, the the food supply chain. Many people get their deliveries direct to home. People can't make it to the shops. People, some people don't have cars. So, what are they going to do with all the build-up of? At the moment, all they need to do is put it on their doorstep. It gets collected. It gets recycled. Um, and uh, I just struggle to see how sending out everybody pitching up in car parts, feeding individual bottles and plastic bottles into into these machines that, are, that probably won't be plentiful enough. And also the way we do shopping now, where where people do small infrequent shops on a regular basis, you don't bring all your recycling to work with you just on the off chance that you know, stop off to do a, a quick shop on the way home. So I think there are there are um, issues issues with it and uh, you also have the potential where you, you have people emptying bins to collect items and then end up with more rubbish on the street uh, because bins have been empty. So uh, so I do I do have some, some concerns with that one. Bob, do you want to come in? Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I, I, just listening to your reflections there, I think most of the conclusions you're drawing are reflected in the position that's in the paper. Um, the only exception is the discussion we had around that DRS, which I recognise your concerns over. Um, I just want to, for a mechanism for us to then move forward, if the current position does reflect our views, bar that one detail, may I propose an amendment uh, which would just be an, an insertion of a new 1.2 after 1.1, which would just read, instruct officers to reflect the view that household collection does not necessarily negate the value of DRS. I think that's that one point that we discussed that we thought might, might be a slight alteration of what is generally actually reflected in the report and to my reading anyway. Can you say again, please? Yes, of course. So it'd be a, a 1.2. So in addition to the, the committee, instructs officers to reflect a view that household collection does not necessarily negate the value of DRS. I'll just be advised that 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 view could be formally committed. And then we can take that through to when we actually complete the actual response. Okay, so uh, you don't feel that needs to be um, ratified by the committee then? I'm happy to minute here. But it's obviously your a view from yourself that you've expressed and happy to express your, your view in the minutes. Yes, just whether if officers are, if, if that if that is from this debate seen as a consensus view, then officers can go forward and reflect it. Uh, if we're not sure about that and we want to put it to a vote, that amendment is a mechanism for that. I don't mind how it's done. Um, but what I do want to do is make sure that either it's reflected by officers because it is a committee view or it's not reflected because it's just a Tom view. Um, yeah. Um, I think the best route would be to minute it because because the we're gonna have, for example, one, one of the ones is 104 questions. So it, it, there's gonna be a lot of answers to lots of very specific detailed questions, but I'm happy to be really happy for it to be minute. Uh, well the minute the minuting it doesn't allow officers to then go and reflect it. Do you see what I'm saying? It just means it's in the minutes. Um, if it's the committee's view, then it should be an item of our feedback to the officers. I don't know whether 
what's the mechanism here? It's hard to watch this on uh, Zoom, isn't it? The former mechanism, I'll, I'll defer to, to Mark, but the former mechanism, if they counter the form of the second, is it? Yeah. yeah that, that should be particularly for, for, for a ball. Yeah, um, the second, that's right. I, I think in the spirit of. No, it's the first. I think in the spirit of what we were trying to do with this is bring it to members' attention, but for a general discussion to get a general theme, um, we were just wondering whether you know formally minimum it um, is a formal record of that that we can take away with. But absolutely yeah, if officers are happy with that, I'm very happy with that. So that's the that's the important thing. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Robin. 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 No, it's just alerting me to the fact that Robin had his arm with Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, I mean, I, I just, I mean, I know we've had the discussion, but I just wanted to echo what Councillor Roberts and Councillor Collins said. But I, I distinctly remember when I was growing up back in the 70s, um, the pop man used to come around to our, come around the street, sell his wares. And then two weeks after, come back and collect those bottles and return the deposit. So I think, you know, ERS, whether it's a council office service or whether it's something that we can work with vendors on, is something that should be um, pursued, I think, is my view. But that's, that's, that's my only contribution. Thank you. Do, do we have any more um, contributions? Okay, in that case, are we happy, happy then to uh, note the recommendations as presented on the paper? Okay. Thank you. Okay, so on to agenda item seven, which is a uh, report. From offices on ash by that, um, the recommendation that you note is important. And hopefully, Nick is still on the end of the Zoom call. Right. Thank you, Chair. Can everyone hear me? Can everyone hear me? Hello? Yes. Yes. Good evening, everybody. Yeah, the recommendation of this report is that the committee notes. The content of the report really containing an overview of the origin of ash dieback, um, current status in the UK um, regionally as well, and uh, it just contains some uh, mitigating actions uh, to help us um, overcome the the fallout from this this pathogen. So uh, we did you know it's it's uh, a fair amount of water has passed under the bridge since this as well as brought up in environment committee i think uh, there have been a number of uh, members briefs and the uh, evening uh, members uh, seminar on trees last december so i just i thought it was important to uh, give a bit of a detailed background just to refresh ourselves um and uh, briefly touch on the physiology itself of this pathogen just because i think that it um lends a bit of perception as to what we are dealing with here so um, the nature of ash dieback, it's a, it's a fungal pathogen which spreads through fungal spores um, which travel in the air, they're airborne. And uh, notably, this pathogen as well uses something called uh, active pathogenesis. And in, in simple plain English, that basically means that it finds its own way into, into a tree. It creates its own doorway into the host and therefore doesn't rely on a previous or pre-existing wound. And what that basically means is that it's really rather indiscriminate. So any age of ash tree um, in any place, and it can you know, uh, reach really any kind of environment as it is windborne, um, could fall um, subject to this, to this pathogen. So ash dieback itself um, originated in Asia. We know that it's been there for um, a very, very long time. The um, indigenous population of Fraxinus or Ash in Asia has actually developed genetic resistance to it, or, or some of uh, the Fraxinus population has. Um, that unfortunately is, uh, is not the case in ash trees found in Europe or England. So around 30 years ago, um, 
uh, ash dieback made its way to the continent and um, since then has basically decimated the, the continent's ash population. Um, and it was first positively identified in England in 2013. So due to the nature which I've just described, there's no real stopping this. It would have been very, very challenging to do to put any sort of mitigating factor or, or impeding factor in um, in the early days if we had been aware of quite how severe this was going to be, but unfortunately we weren't. So we're now in the stage of having to just live with it and uh, make sure that we minimise the uh, ecological impact of losing uh, one of the UK's third most abundant trees. So we're talking about a very, very large portion of the, uh, the UK's treescape we're, we're about to lose. Um, less so in terms of city treescapes. Um, I think uh, County Councils are going to have a, uh, a far worse time with this than City Councils. Um, I said the third most abundant tree species there in the UK, but I think that equates to, on average, about 4% of the average city's tree population. So it is going to be very challenging, but fortunately um, for us, not as challenging as it's going to be for, for County Councils. Um, So, yeah, so the ash population in Worcester City itself, it's, it's fairly uh, spread out. We've got um, uh, ash uh, trees found on our premier parks, uh, riversides, uh, car parks as well, and uh, most notably two um, woodlands in the Warnden area. Um, they're predominantly uh, made up of uh, mature ash um, in plantation form. Fortunately, though, because of a change of uh, management historically from conservation area, from plantation world to conservation area, we're starting to see pioneer species come up in the scrub layer of these woodlands. So with a bit of target planting in areas where ash trees happen to be felled, we, we can help mitigate the ecological fallout there quite well. So we're likely to see the biggest loss of ash um, in the next 10 years and uh, yeah so yeah it's it is also um very important that we uh maintain ash trees retain ash trees as they are at the moment until they're possibly identified with flora because there's a small chance that some of the population may be genetically resistant and uh it's important to retain those to you know ensure the species existence for the future so we have brought together some uh action move forward with in order to uh, help minimise the financial and ecological impact of ash dieback in Worcester. Um, it's, it's going to be, you know, as, as this problem is uh, developing, it's, going, it's pretty more and more challenging just because of the, the nature of the pathogens I've suggested, uh, as I've uh, explained rather. To combat the unpredictability of this, um, Environmental Operations has recently just procured new bespoke tree inspection software, which is a vast improvement on the software we've been using previously. Um, this drastically increases the accuracy and efficiency of um, tree inspections across the city, which is going to help me very much in my job. We've also raised the priority level of areas containing ash trees and individual ash trees from whatever they were originally too high, which means they'll be subject now to a six monthly inspection rotor. So any changes there in the tree's health, we should be able to pick up really, really rather quickly and then, and then action whatever, whatever works needs to be done to um, make that tree safe. So on that note, it's not fully understood the, um, the impact on the structural integrity of an ash tree of Clara. We know that um, it will eventually succumb and die and therefore make it unstable. But um, there is research to suggest that once a tree has it, you know, uh, we, as we are not sure, it will um, mean that there will have to be changes made to the management methodology we'll use. So having climbers, say, dismantle the tree may long, you know, no longer be accepted or you know, uh, accepted practice. So we'll have to think of uh, different ways using, say, mutes or straight felling, or, you know, to, to try and combat that. Um, so, uh, one second. So during the last six months, um, 
using our pre-existing tree surveying software. I've been trying to collate as much data as possible with the ASP population we've got at the moment. Um, this is a part that we'll be featuring in our quarterly performance review on Pensana. Uh, new plantation, yeah, we've got that. Um, so we, it's, it's a particularly difficult time of year as well. We uh, just coming into what well, we've just gone past spring ash trees have just come into bloom now and it's now the time where i need to be out there identifying areas of new infection um, we have had isolated um, areas of infection across the city um, the most recent one i've seen was in the bramble or the Bramblewood project in lansdowne road allotments so there's a very small ash there and that that has been positively identified of having clara but a neighboring tree right next to it another ash tree exactly the same uh, size and maturity had not had not yet succumbed to that illness i think that's a bit of a you know a bit of an example of just how random sporadic and hard to predict this this pathogen can be um so another approach to gaining an understanding of where we are with clara and Worcester at the moment is by working closely with partners so we're keeping open lines of communication with the county council the duckworth trust the uh, Canal and River Trust to, to just, you know, keep on top of how this develops in terms of within the city. Um, and uh, as this is a developing issue, um, it, and it, because of the sporadic and random nature of the pathogen requires an ad hoc firefighting approach to the problem, um, members will be briefed uh, annually. Uh, but there is also the option of increasing that to a six-month briefing if the pathogen reaches a, a zenith in Worcester. So that's what we've got there. I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the uh, presentation. Um, I think we've got a question from the floor. No, I think uh, the length of the hour is apparent. Uh, so uh, thank you, Nick, and if we have all happy to, um, I don't think to just note the recommendation, note the report. Thank you very much. The, the sound quality is pretty poor coming through here. So we, it's really only possible, I don't know whether I might, I'm more hard of hearing than most people, but I'm picking up about 40%. If, if any more contributions have to come from that direction, that, that, that's, that's it. Because that's that's it. It. we are finding there's a lot of what we're struggling to hear is actually printed on the report. So um, it's also it wasn't how hard work. The, the technology was intended. I, I appreciate it. Yeah. No, I do believe that's the last Zoom contribution we've got this evening. Uh, so we're on to agenda item eight, uh, arterial routes. So I'm just going to hand over uh, to, to Lloyd to introduce this item. Thank you, Chair. And consciously, I was going to keep it very brief on what we're doing with the, uh, at, at all. Um, we've got a report in front of us to Northern. It relates to the arterial routes project that this, which this committee has kept uh, hold of the reins on for the last couple of years. We go back to the council motion and um, for council staff to kick this all off, and then that fed its way through to uh, this committee recommending a budget um, to uh, undertake that work. Paragraph 2.6 uh, sets out the brief of that project, and then paragraphs 3.2 through 3.8 update members on what has been done. Um, and just to remind members, we really, this was a key project on the this whole part of last year. Uh, and, and we believe um, we need to be uh, a level of work now undertaken, and um, that, that that project can now be can now be closed out. So, brief chair, but hopefully the board sets up the uh, the deal that uh, clearly. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Lloyd. So, basically, you're saying what was a project is now part of normal normal business. Um, do we have any comments or questions? Okay. So, are we happy to make the recommendation? On to item, uh, agenda item nine, which is the, the, the quarterly performance report. So, uh, again, this is for noting something, going to hand over to uh, Lloyd. 
Chair Tim O'Bain, um, this is the quarter four um, and the annual, this is the quarter four 2021 and the annual 2021 uh, update the uh, the committee scorecard, so key projects and, uh, and, and KPIs. And just to remind members, the KPIs and projects on this uh, scorecard, some of those are now being amended or replaced uh, for the 21 22 and financial year. So again, Chair, I don't think we can do any of the, uh, the projects or KPIs in detail. Um, but myself, have a few questions okay. uh, Simon. Uh, a couple of things really. Um, there's there's a few items on here which I think certainly one of them I'm not even sure should be in this report at all, which is one on the back page, page 42. This is about um, renewals of taxi drivers' licences. Uh, well, I, I don't know what that's doing on this report, but I, I'll just park that one for a second. And there's a couple of others which I think probably come under the same umbrella, which are um, right at the start of the report, the task and finish recommendations on the quality development of taxi strategy. Um, the, the thing that I was really drawn to, though, is on page 30, which is that household waste recycling. <clears throat> um, the description there says percentage of household waste that is sent for recycling through green dries. Uh, my Concern, perhaps I'm uh, overly cynical, but when I see something that says sent for recycling, I have visions of it being sent for recycling and ending up being sent to Turkey to a landfill. Um, I, we don't seem to have any cast iron guarantees that what we put in our green bins actually gets recycled. And I, I know this isn't. The territory of the city council, but as we're collecting this stuff, I think we have a right to have a say in where it goes. And I wonder if it'd be possible as a committee to to, to express an interest in, in getting some real reassurance, or better still, a guarantee that recycling gets recycled. Thank, thank you, Simon. Thanks. I think. The, the tax items, whatever, what, what um, the Lord was referring to, that I think we removed from, from, from the report. And it, 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 certainly, when I when I first a new member on the Environment Committee, we did, we did uh, have a, an invite to go and visit the patient centre and the um, incinerator. So I will ask officers to see if we can extend that invitation when when the um, you know, COVID situation is like and speak, speak to several ways. Uh, and certainly we have in the past, going back a few years, have a sort of presentation on, on the, the other end of the, you know, we keep the collection, but actually the whole, the whole site. So again, certainly happy to look and see how that's best done, whether it's done as part of the visit or whether we can have a presentation at some point, come, come to the committee and, and be able to, you know, see what happens to the waste that's that's collected from our households. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll look into that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that, that would be really interesting. Um, thanks if you can organise that. I'm sure it will be interesting to, to take that up. Um, it, the, the, the concern remains though about the if effectively the totality of of what we put in the recycling bins needs to be recycled because that's the basis on which people of Worcester trust that system. And if that trust breaks down, then recycling will start going in any old bin. We have any uh, further questions or comments on the performance report? Neil. 
So, you know, I'm just thank you to everyone who's been able to get on with so many different disparate projects during the lockdown. Um, and I appreciate some deadlines we missed, but I'm really pleased to see that some are on track. And I just want to say thank you to officers and really difficult time. There's a lot of interesting, exciting things going on. So thank you. Thank you, Neil. And this is it. This is starting to skew it. Robin might give me a stop while we get back to this. But in Morden uh, uh, and Parish, I noticed that the, and I totally approve of this, uh, that great swathes of grass haven't been cut. And it's obviously by design. Is that a policy I've missed somewhere? Jack, and looking for that, we, we are getting uh, a frequent number of requests from uh, you know, uh, uh, residence groups, uh, you know, uh, councillors, uh, other groups to. Um, the land a bit more wide, mm -hmm. um, and, and then we should take schools, but I don't know about that particular location, so I can, I can check that, but um, I'm not sure about that precise location. Thank you, Chair. What are you going on? I'm going to show you the photograph. <laughs> oh, oh. Uh, the way Just following on from what Andrew's just mentioned, is it possible to get some communications from the council regarding things like no, no, no? and cutting of grass verges because I've had issues in my ward recently with this and for every one person who wants us to leave grass verge there's 10 people that want it there because they think it looks messy so if we could get something from the council to say there are areas that we're not knowing for biodiversity reasons that would be great because it would mean that I have to stop phoning residents and ask them about it okay uh, I'm really happy to make a note but I think it is an interesting point. Some areas lend themselves to it. Other areas might might result in areas in the, in the city looking scruffy and result in complaints. So it is a balancing act, and then I hope we can have a good policy for balances. Can, can I make it clear? I'm not complaining. So I've got a photograph here with all the, the natural progress, and it's still in the swing. It's obviously done with this something very well. Yeah, certainly. I mean, a couple of years ago, we we, we had quite a large um, project in planting. Wildflowers and being lots of areas, so we can continue with that on a more natural basis. The record for me, Jeff, who's starting to come from the market in Ross? Do we do we have any other comments, questions? No? Okay, then so we're happy to note the recommendation on the invite of nine. No items of uh, any other business. So on that note, I close the meeting. Thank you very much for your attendance and your patience earlier.